Good to be here with you again this morning. Um, we'll be in First Peter. Um, I've got three, three verses that we're covering. I've got three pages of notes for it. Um, I'm going to continue the sermon, the, this, uh, the next part next week. But it's, um, you might think it's a little crazy for just three... Um, three verses to take so many notes, but there's so much theology in these, um, this passage of Scripture. And um, it's reassuring. It's, uh, it gives us assurance of where we stand in the Lord and who God is. And we're going to... I'm going to read the uh, passage of Scripture... And we'll pause for prayer, and then we'll, we'll get into it. Would, would you stand for the reading of the word with me? We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Born again, a living hope is the next section. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that we can gather together to um, read your word, come together to worship you, to honor you, Lord, to acknowledge that you are our God, you are our King, and um, without you we are lost, completely lost. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit would... um, Open our eyes um, and give us understanding, give us discernment, so that we may understand just how great this passage of Scripture is and that it would bring peace to those that, that need uh, a comforting hand this morning. We love you, Lord, and we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So... Um, when, when I mention the name Peter, for those of you that are uh, Sunday school graduates, um, you, you may know who Peter is. What kind of thoughts come to mind when we say Peter? Who is Peter? And you can, you can, you can talk back. It's okay. Peter. What, does that, what kind of thoughts come to your mind when you think of him? Boldness. Back here. I heard something else. There we go. Walking on water. Someone else? I, leader. He was a leader. All of these things is Peter. And a lot of us, I myself, I like Peter. I like Paul also. Um, Paul, and then, sometimes you've got friends and they are polar opposites of each other but you still like them both, you know, and, and they may not get along with each other, <laughs> but, I mean, you get along great with them. And Peter and Paul are different, but they both love the Lord. Um, I, I like Peter in the sense that um, he was bold, but he also messed up. And, and so I'm like, yeah, I can identify with that. I, I can, you know, I can mess up, uh, you know, once or twice. But, who we are dealing with, again, walking on water. We think of Peter as being this bold guy that stepped out in faith into the water as he sees his Lord and Savior. And he says, if it's you, tell me to come out. And he he just goes right out there until he realized, oh, I'm in, uh uh-oh. And he starts sinking. The same Peter, when Jesus was saying, who do the people say that I am? 
What does he answer? You're the son of the living God. Well, some say that you're this guy. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're uh, a, a prophet. And, and he, again, listening to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, God working in him, he just boldly. But this same Peter took a sword and chopped somebody's ear off. We, well, I, I can speak for myself. I can, I can be a bull in a china cabinet, I'm telling you. I, you know, sometimes, no grace whatsoever. I'll tell you a story, and this may reveal something about me. Um, I remember vividly, I was in kindergarten. My parents are pastoring across the border, and we always had a little bit of extra change in our pockets. And I had some pesos in my pockets. And I went to my kindergarten class and, uh, and going about the day, and I saw this little girl playing with a peso, these old pesos, the bigger stuff that actually counted for something. Um, and I saw her playing with it, and I'm like, that is my peso. She took my peso. You know, I had plans for that peso. And after some gnawing and crawling and scratching, and, okay, you can have the peso. <laughs> Later on in the day, I reach in my pocket, guess where that peso was? Right in there. I can mess up. I can make assumptions. I can act without knowing. And so that's why I identify, I think, with Peter. Peter is a perfect example of a human being that doesn't have it all together. But later on in life, he, he writes these epistles. He has the wisdom later on to think back and have some advice for those of us that have a tendency to, to stumble. The same Peter, the day of Pentecost, through the power of the Holy Spirit, preached and 3,000 came to know the Lord. 3,000. That's, that's a good service. His greeting, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle, but some people get that confused with a disciple. An apostle is someone that is sent. Someone that is sent by Christ himself. He is one of the original 12 that Jesus chose to disciple, to teach and grow them up, to be leaders. And then we see in Acts them taking just the world by storm and starting this movement that is Christianity. He's one of the original 12. He can say, I saw what Jesus did, and he does in his, in his writings. He can testify to the fact that all of these things that, that we hear about Jesus doing, he can say, I was there to see it. There, there is great value in the, in the written word. There is great value in, in, in a testimony and something that is written out. But when somebody tells you, I was there to see it, I mean, we, we, have, to, we have to pay attention. We have to listen up. And so Peter is saying, I write to you as a sent one that was there to see Jesus at work. And he says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, there is a great deal of controversy um, about the, this word elect. Um, some might say, is, is that God choosing some people to go to eternity with him and then thereby choosing others to be apart from him for eternity? Those can be troubling words. If, if, we, if we think about that, 
He has chosen some to be with him and others to be away from him for eternity and eternal damnation. That's severe. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bith Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God, God knows everything. God knows he's not limited by time and space like we are. We see past, present, future. He sees the whole picture. I, I heard an illustration, uh, a, and it's a faulty illustration, but it, it might help us out a little bit. It's like seeing a parade through, through a hole. This is all you can see, and there goes the parade, and there's the start, and there's the middle, and then the end, versus being on top of a building and seeing the whole thing all the way through. God is not limited by what we are limited. He knows. He knows who will be in eternity with him. That, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, there will be people that are saved and there will be people that will not be saved. But it's according to his foreknowledge, Peter is telling us. We, we serve and, and, um, and we worship a loving God, one who is gracious and merciful that gives us every opportunity, every opportunity, so that we may be reconciled with him, so that no one may perish. So there will be, the, to those who are elect, it's those that will be him in eternity. It's not that complicated. It's those that will be with him forever, worshiping him. There, there are uh, some controversial pastors that, um, that might take a stance on that word that um, paint a picture of a God that might seem like he's not very merciful. But he gave his son. He gave his son so that we may be saved because there was no way that we could earn it. There is no way that we could be good enough to earn eternity with him. This is the God that we serve, a loving God that has given us the opportunity through his son to be with him in eternity. That's what elect means, those that will be with him. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. This is the, um, the Trinitarian view of God. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Again, he knows who will choose him. And then the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. That means that when, um, when we are saved and this may not sit well. I'm not sure. I don't know. I can't pretend to know all of you and your theology. But what this is pointing to is that walking down that aisle and coming and saying a prayer and then walking back out those doors is not, does not, not guarantee you eternity. That's what it's coming down to. Is this is a start. The Holy Spirit and sanctification in our lives, the Holy Spirit working in us, sanctifying us, is the rest of our life here. That means that we still have some bad habits. We still have some muck in here that needs to be cleansed. And for the rest of our life, so long as we breathe, so long as we're on this broken earth, he is going to be working on us. So, if we, if we come say that prayer, and walk out, and we're no different the rest of our lives than when we started before that prayer, then we need to ask ourselves some questions. Am I really saved? Am I really one of the elect? 
Because there needs to be a transformation. There needs to be a change in our life. And it may be gradual for all of us. It, it's going to be different. Some may be a dramatic change right there and then. For others, it may take a while. But like we talked about before, a Christian tree is going to give Christian fruit. There will be things that you can see in the life of the person that has claimed that Jesus is their Savior that will tell you that person is different, he is different, and I can't point my finger on it, but there is something about that guy. So that's what this means. In the sanctification of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord working in us and cleansing us. For the obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. The grace and peace that we're talking about, it's not um, peace as in no conflict, as in no war. There, there is conflict all around us. The grace and peace that we're talking about is that no matter what we face, no matter what we see in our lives, no matter what troubles or what sickness or whatever tribulations that we may face, peace, the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ in our lives will give us comfort. There are veterans of the faith, and I'm sure that, that we all know some, that, man... They just get hit from all sides and still they are firm. That's, I aspire to be that. That no matter what comes at me that I can stand firm and continue my walk in the Lord. I aspire to be that kind of a person. And that's the peace that Peter is talking about right here. Is that man... I pray for you. His pastoral and fatherly um, attributes are coming out in Peter. He's an older guy now, and, and he's caring for the church. And he's saying, man, I hope this is multiplied in your life, that the grace and peace of God, no matter what you see, that he will comfort you, that you may know that he has you in his hand, when everybody else seems to have left us, when, when we just are losing hope that his grace and peace still hold us. And that it may be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acknowledging God the Father. He is such a good God. That although we were enemies, although we were combatants, we were on separate sides, we were, on the, we, we were lost, blind, and he is such a holy God, and we had a great debt to him. In our sin, lost and blind, still as enemies, He is such a gracious God, such a good God, such an awesome God that he offered up his son. According to his mercy is the next section. According to his mercy. Not because we've earned it. Not because there's something special about us, but because there's something special about him. Sometimes there's, um, there's this debate about when, when Easter comes around about who killed, who is responsible for the death of Jesus. Some, some may say it was the Jewish priests some might say it, it, it was um, the Romans. It was 
the wrath of God poured over his son. Because of my sin. What I deserved, what I should have gotten, he took in my place. And it was, it was one thing to go through the torture. It was one thing to be on that cross. It, it was one thing to be pierced, to have that crown of thorns. The scripture talks about that he suffered like no, and was tortured like no other person in history. And it's true. But you, some people might think, well, I think there's been other, you know, beheadings and there's all kinds of other stuff physically that people have gone through. Maybe. But the weight of the sin of the world just intensifies that. He took my sin and yours and the wrath of God for that sin. God the Father pouring out his wrath on Jesus Christ. That's like a whoa moment, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us. What does that word mean, caused? He's made it happen. He has caused us to be born again. How can we boast in anything? How can we not have mercy to those that are lost when we know that no part of us had anything to do with him causing this? We can't Go to those that are lost and in judgment and say, man, you need to straighten up. And no. There should be grace and mercy and love pouring out of us. Because that's what we got. Nothing, no part of us earned this. It was God. It was all God. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That means that he has worked and prepped us to be able to hear the gospel from someone else that he has worked in to deliver the gospel and opened up our ears and opened up our hearts and our minds so that we may be receptive to understand and have discernment and have our eyes opened up to the truth of the gospel. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that reassuring that no matter that we are so deprived that he cared enough for us because he is such a great God. He has caused us to be born again. So, he's prepped us. And he somehow orchestrated that we would listen to this um, message, that we would listen to this gospel. All right? Prepped us. We listen. We hear. Our eyes are opened up. And then his, his only son, his son, has paid our debt. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the dead. It's not any longer the baby in the manger. It's not any longer Christ on the cross. He was brought down. He went into a tomb, but he rose again. He rose again. He is a living God. Not a statue, not up there on the cross still suffering? No. He is preparing a place for all of us. For those that would call him Savior. For those that would call him King. 
I, that blows me away. I am encouraged and, and pushed forward to continue to be obedient, to pr- spread the gospel of this great God. And Peter is blown away by this. These elect exiles that he is talking about, he, he originally wrote this letter to different churches, to people in different churches, trying to encourage, trying to be a good pastor, trying to be a good leader, and encouraging them, and reminding them of the base. Peter is laying out through the epistles the basics of faith. We don't want to assume that everybody here is on the same page. Some of us may be theologians, and we understand every bit of... So we'll understand that it's necessary to get back down to the basics, because not all of us understand. Some of us may be just, somebody dragged us here. I know what that's like. But again, if we believe that this is true, then God has orchestrated you being here today to let you know, hey, I sent my son on your behalf. Will you please acknowledge him? And so Peter is pastoring his flock. He is taking care of these churches to these elect exiles. But this also applies to us. Obviously, we're reading and we're studying this passage of Scripture today. But there is no mistake in this word exile. What is that talking about? This world is not our home. He is making reference to the people of Israel being cast out, sent to Babylon. And he is saying, this is not your home. But like the people in Babylon, we are to invest in this city. We are to care for this city. We are to care for this world and make sure that they are not lost, and make sure that they can hear about this great God. He says, go, go and make disciples. And so our mission, whether you're in the back pew, or third, <laughs> a third from the back. Hey, I like the back pew. I confessed that the other night. I, that was home for me. But um, we are to take this message as ambassadors, as his representatives, and go and disciple. That means we are to be heavily, intimately involved with people and tell them about Jesus. Jesus. God is going to work through each and every one of us in different ways, and we have different giftings, and some of us may not be able to sing. I don't think I can. My wife says that I can, but I, I can't play the bass, that's for sure. I, I admire anybody that can do all that. <laughs> we have... Praise, praise God. <laughs> Amen. We, ha- we all have different giftings. But our mission is all the same. We all have the same. Well, I can't preach, I can't teach, I can't do... It doesn't have to be up here. But we do need to preach the gospel. And it may be on a one-on-one basis. It may be just meeting with this other person and we're telling them about, about Jesus. But we are to proclaim the gospel. All of us. So, that's what Peter is reminding us. 
today. We're exiles. We may be living here, but our citizenship is with him. Don't hold on too tightly. He's telling these people that he's, that he's writing to, don't hold on too tightly to, to Galatia or Cappadocia or Asia or Bithynia. I, I skipped the first one on purpose because I don't know how to pronounce that one. Don't hold on too tightly to these places. This world is not your home. I'm blown away by his, his grace and his mercy in my life personally. This is me being selfish and just focusing on, on that. When I see, if I get a chance to, and I can tell you my testimony, I will. But when I see my origins and the stuff that I've gone through, the journey that I've gone through, and where I'm at now, I'm just blown away. Blown away that I serve a sovereign God because he knows it all. Foreknowledge, right? And that he could bring me to the place where I am. I'm just blown away. And I, I live for the opportunity that I can tell people about this God that saved me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, we thank you for your love, your mercy, God. You know us intimately. You know every fiber of our being, where we mess up, God, the tendencies that we still have the things that you're still working on in our lives. And you see every detail of our life, and yet you still love us. We are intimately known, and yet you still love us. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to serve you, Lord, to be a part of your kingdom. That you've entrusted us with this message. Thank you, Lord. We love and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.